All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at our respiratory system here and really breaking things down into the different parts and components so that you have a much better understanding of what is involved in this system. The point of this is so that in future lessons, when we talk about things that relate to the respiratory system, that you guys will have a good foundation of understanding of what's going on here and the different parts that are involved. So make sure you guys keep watching because I'm going to explain that all fully here. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson. And my goal here with ICU Advantage is to take these complex topics about critical care subjects and really break them down and make them easy to understand for you. I hope that I'm able to do just that. And hopefully by the end of this video, I'll have earned a subscription from you. And as always, a special thank you to all of our awesome, loyal subscribers out there. You guys continue to watch and support this channel, and really, without you guys, this channel would be nothing. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with our lesson here. Let's begin our talk about the respiratory system. But before we start, I'm really curious to know, what are you looking to learn from this lesson? Head on down to the comments below, because I'd love to hear what part of the respiratory system you least understand. And hopefully by the end of this lesson, I will have cleared that up for you or answered whatever question that you had. If not, I am going to be on here responding to your comments to really try and answer them or explain whatever's going on in a little bit more detail so that you do understand it. All right, so what is the respiratory system? Essentially, this is the system that consists of all the organs that are involved in breathing. And this system really has two very important functions. One is to bring oxygen into our body, which is really needed to allow our cells to live and function properly, something that we call cellular respiration. Now, in addition to that, the other important function is to rid our bodies of carbon dioxide, which, as we know, is a waste product of this cellular respiration. So when we have issues that come up with our respiratory system, it makes it harder for us to get the oxygen that we need and to get rid of the carbon dioxide each which comes with its own set of problems. Now, there are several components that make up this respiratory system pathway, and we can divide this up into two different tracts. We have our upper respiratory tract and our lower respiratory tract. To start, though, we're going to start talking about our upper respiratory tract here. Now, these parts of the respiratory system are going to be above the sternal angle, which is essentially outside of our thorax, as well as above, at or above the level of the vocal cords, so essentially above our cricoid cartilage. And this upper part of our respiratory tract is going to aid in the passage of air. It's going to help to moisten that warm air before reaching our lungs. Now, within this tract, we do have three main parts. The first is going to be our nasal oral cavity. And this is going to be the first entry of air into our body, either through our mouth or our nose. The second part is going to be a, an area that we call our pharynx. And this is where we have a common pathway for both the respiratory and the digestive system. This section of the tract here really also plays an important role in our ability to vocalize. And the pharynx is composed of three different parts that are above the epiglottis and the larynx. And these parts are our nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is the part of the throat that's connecting to the esophagus. It's at this point where this common pathway of the respiratory and the digestive system are going to diverge. And this is where we have that flap of connective tissue. You can see it right in here called the epiglottis that closes to cover our airway to prevent aspiration. Now, the last part of the upper respiratory tract that we're going to talk about here is something that we call the larynx. And this is what we also commonly refer to as our voice box. Sometimes you'll see this included in both the upper and the lower respiratory tract, but this part plays a vital role in air passageway as well as our vocalization. And these vocal folds that you see right here are one of our primary landmarks for intubation. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and talk about the lower respiratory tract here. And this one's going to be a bit more complex, but this is also something that you'll sometimes hear referred to as either the respiratory tree or the tracheobronchial tree. And this is going to be due to the branching structure of the different components here. It's actually pretty interesting. The average person has 23 different branches of the lower respiratory tract. 
So for our lower respiratory tract, we do have four main parts to this tract. The first of these is going to be what we call our trachea. And this is essentially a tube of cartilage that connects the larynx to the lungs. This has complete rings of cartilage here at the top called our cricoid cartilage. And towards the bottom, we have incomplete C-shaped rings of what we call hyaline cartilage. And these ones are typically quite elastic. Now the inside of our trachea is lined with ciliated epithelial cells, and these do contain goblet cells, which produce these things called mucins, which are a key component in the production of mucus. And if we ever have narrowing or obstruction of this part of our airway, this is what's going to lead to what we call strider, which is that high-pitched, extra-thoracic breathing sound that you can hear sometimes. This can be heard on both inspiration and expiration, but usually it's going to be inspiration where you hear this. All right, now the second part of our lower respiratory tract is something that we call bronchi. And this is really the beginning of this segmentation that we see for the lower respiratory tract. We're able to divide this up in a few different parts, and the first of these are going to be both our left and our right main bronchus. This is also what we refer to as our primary bronchi. Now our landmark for this is really where the trachea divides at something that we call the carina, which is right about here, at about the fifth vertebrae. Now this split here is going to carry air to one of each of our two lungs. Now our right bronchus here is actually wider, shorter, and more vertical than the left. And so oftentimes we see this as a straight pathway for some sort of aspiration or if we have an ET tube on intubation that is overly inserted. Both of these have large lumens and they're again lined with those ciliated epithelial cells. They do have smooth muscle cells though below the epithelial cells that also contain these mucus producing cells. And we notice that as the branching continues throughout this system, we're going to see less and less hyaline cartilage and more and more smooth muscle present in these airways. But this muscle and cartilage is giving support to really help keep those airways open. All right, so after our primary bronchi, the next split we have is something that we call our lobar bronchi, also what we call secondary bronchi. Now here is where we have the main bronchi that's divided further to carry air to each of the lobes of the lung. And so because of this, we know that we're going to have three lobar bronchi on the right, but only two on the left because the left part of our lung only has two lobes. Now next from here, we're going to have what we call our segmental bronchi. These are also referred to as our tertiary bronchi. Now these here are further branching to carry air to each of the segments of that lobe of the lung. And then finally, after our segmental bronchi, we have what we call our subsegmental bronchi. And these are really our fourth, fifth, and sixth order branchings that we see, which just continue to branch out and increase in number until we get to the next main part of our lower respiratory tract, something that we call bronchioles. Now our bronchioles, these are the smaller branches of our respiratory tract. At this point, they no longer contain hyaline cartilage, and they're actually going to rely on support from elastic fibers that are attached to the surrounding lung tissue. Now these also have epithelial cells without glands though, surrounded by this smooth muscle. And these bronchioles continue to branch out through many different levels of what we call conducting bronchioles, ending in a set of what we refer to as terminal bronchioles. And these terminal bronchioles really are at the end of something that we refer to as the conducting zone. And from there, we enter into what we refer to as the respiratory zone, which consists of even smaller branches, something that we call respiratory bronchioles. And then finally, once we've gone through all of these different levels of branching, we reach the fourth and final part of the lower respiratory tract, what we call the lungs. And the lungs is where all the magic happens. This is where the gas exchange is going to take place. Now from here, you're never going to guess it, but we can actually divide this tissue up even further. And so to do that, let's look a little bit closer in our lungs here. And let's take a look and we can see that this part here is actually one of these respiratory bronchioles that we were just talking about. And so these different components that I was just talking about are going to be the first one here, which is our alveolar duct. Next, we have this big collection here, something that we call the alveolar sac. And then finally, within this sac, 
we have what we call an alveolus, or if we're talking about multiple of these, these are what we call alveoli. Now, essentially, the alveolar duct just connects our respiratory bronchioles to the actual alveolar sac. The alveolar sac, though, is the smallest functional unit within our respiratory tract. As you can see here, it contains multiple alveoli that are all connected through a common duct. And the alveolus is where this actual gas exchange is going to take place. We have something in the order of 300 to 500 million of these alveoli, giving us a surface area of 750 square feet, or 70 meters squared, if those numbers make more sense to you. So just a massive amount of these alveoli giving us a massive amount of surface area for this gas exchange to take place. Now each of these alveoli are wrapped in a mesh of capillaries that actually cover about 70% of their surface in order to enable that gas exchange to take place. And so I'm not gonna go into detail about gas exchange here. I actually have another video lesson in the series talking about ABGs where I really break this down in a lot of detail. So I'm gonna link to that up above as well as down in the show notes in case you guys wanna watch that. But essentially here, this is where we've reached the end of our respiratory tract, the final destination for the air. All right, the next thing that I want to talk about with our respiratory system here is actually going to be the different muscles that we use for respiration. So these are going to be the muscles that contribute to either our inhalation or our exhalation. These muscles are going to aid in the expansion and the contraction of our thoracic cavity, which allows that air to move in and out of our lungs. These muscles consist of three main groups. The first of these is what we call our diaphragm. And our diaphragm is really the main muscle that's responsible for breathing. And it's actually a thin dome-shaped muscle that's gonna separate our thoracic cavity from our abdominal cavity and is located down at the base of the lungs. So for inspiration, what happens is the diaphragm contracts, causing it to lower in the center and actually raise here on the edges, helping to expand that thoracic cavity. And by doing this, it's gonna compress the abdominal cavity down, raise those ribs upward and outward, and like I said, expand that thoracic cavity, drawing air down into our lungs. For expiration though, the diaphragm simply relaxes and we have the elastic recoil of the thoracic wall is gonna cause that thoracic cavity to contract, forcing the air back out. Now the second group for our muscles of respiration is gonna be what we call our intercostal muscles. And these muscles actually play an important role in our respiration. Now these muscles you're gonna find attached between our ribs. And essentially what these are gonna do is control the width of our rib cage, and it's gonna contract and pull the lower rib up and outwards towards our upper rib. And this is what causes our rib cage to rise, aiding in that inhalation. Now the last group of muscles that we're going to talk about here is going to be what we refer to as our accessory muscles. So these muscles do assist, but they don't play a primary role in our respiration. So typically these muscles are only going to be used under conditions of high metabolic demand, such as exercising or some sort of respiratory dysfunction. There's a whole multitude of different muscles that really have been observed in aiding in our respiration. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them, but Really, this includes things like our sternocleidomastoid, our scalene, pectoralis, as well as trapezius, just to name a few. Now, if you see these muscles being used at rest, this is going to be a sign of respiratory distress. All right, so all of this is great with our respiratory system, but it really doesn't do a lot of good unless we actually have blood that's flowing to our heart. So really, the last thing that I want to talk about here is going to be our pulmonary vasculature. Within this vasculature, we have two different arterial circulations that go to our lungs. The first of these is what we call our pulmonary circulation, and this is gonna be the circulation that ultimately ends up being involved in the gas exchange that we're looking for. This circulation does consist of pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins, but one of the distinctions here is that the pulmonary arteries in this case are actually carrying deoxygenated blood on their way to the lungs for that gas exchange, and the pulmonary veins are now the ones carrying the oxygenated blood back to the left side of our heart. Now the blood in this system starts in our right ventricle and ultimately ends up draining in our left atrium. This blood is gonna initially come from the right ventricle into what we call the pulmonary trunk, which is gonna further divide into our left and right pulmonary arteries. 
And this is happening adjacent to the crina, where we also see the left and right main bronchus split. Now from here, we're going to see further pulmonary arteries divide down with our bronchi. And they're going to further divide down into our pulmonary arterioles, all the way through all the branches of the different bronchioles, and eventually coming all the way down to our alveoli, and eventually forming this bed of capillaries around these alveoli. From here, that gas exchange is going to take place in the capillaries, oxygenating that blood, and those pulmonary capillaries are going to drain into our pulmonary venules. Now these pulmonary venules are going to turn into pulmonary veins, again accompanying this bronchial tree as they go along, and ultimately leading to two different veins that are leaving each of our lungs, our superior and our inferior, and ultimately will drain into our left atrium. From here, the left side of our heart has this oxygenated blood to be able to pump throughout the rest of our body. Now, it is important to know that this system, since it's originating from the right ventricle, is actually going to be a low-pressure system, and we're normally going to see systolic pressures in the range of 20 to 25. Again, the primary goal here is to move that blood around that's going to eventually take part in the gas exchange. So that leads into the other pulmonary vasculature system that we have, something that we call our bronchial circulation. This system here consists of bronchial arteries and veins, and this system actually comes from our systemic circulation. So it's going to come off the third or fourth intercostal artery from the aorta. And so because of this, this is actually going to make this a high-pressure system. The goal of this system, though, is to provide oxygenated blood to the actual lung tissue itself. This is going to go to the airways all the way down through the terminal bronchioles. This is going to cover the, the visceral pleura of our lung, as well as supplying oxygen to the walls of the blood vessels that make up our pulmonary circulation. From there, the blood is going to primarily drain into the azygous and the hemizygous veins, but we do actually have a small portion of blood that returns back into the pulmonary veins, and so because of this, we actually create a small physiological shunt because we're actually adding deoxygenated blood returning back to the left side of the heart. All right, you guys, that's our respiratory system here. Hopefully this was a good explanation for you guys. I really went in depth in this to hopefully give you guys a good understanding of all the different parts and components that play a vital role in our respiratory system. I really hope that you guys like this lesson. If you did, please leave us a like down below, as well as if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel down below there too. Make sure though that you guys ring the bell on there so that way you'll be notified as soon as a new lesson becomes available for you guys to watch. Now I also just started a Patreon page for ICU Advantage, so make sure and head over there and show us some support, as well as check us out on some other social media such as Instagram and Facebook. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. You guys have a wonderful day.